Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out this afternoon. Uh, I'm George Ingram, and I'm a senior fellow here at Brookings. And I'm very pleased to be here with this fabulous panel to launch the report on a survey of over 90 development leaders from government, the private sector, civil society, on how they see the development field changing today and what the future is. I'm going to be very brief so we can get directly to the substance. My, and the process today is my co-author, Kristen Lord, is going to present the report. Kristen is CEO of IREX um, and has spent her career both in government, uh, teaching at universities, at several think tanks, including Brookings, so welcome home, um, and now leading a major development organization. Um, our panelists are, you know very well, Henrietta Four is Executive Director of UNICEF, Patrick Fine is President and CEO of FHI 360, and Rob Mossbacker is Head of the Consensus for Development Reform. Um, what I can say about all of them is they have all served at the highest level in the U.S. government, uh, they've been leaders in civil society. Um, and with Rob and Henrietta, they've also done stints with the private sector between their civil society and government work. And Rob still is with the private sector as chair of an energy company. Um, after Kristen makes the presentation, we'll have a panel conversation, and then we'll engage the audience. Kristen? I was promised this would be really, really, really simple. So let's see. There we are. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, before I start, I'm going to thank just a few people because even though it's Washington, we can still be gracious and show appreciation of people. Uh, the first person I want to thank is uh, George Ingram. George is still speaking to me after being roped into this, and he's been an incredible partner. He did a tremendous amount of work on this, so George, thank you. From soup to nuts, uh, George uh, did such an amazing job on this. I, I also want to thank the communications team at Brookings and our own communications team. Uh, Alex Cole, our director, is here today. Uh, I want to thank Marie Weston, who helped us with all the logistics. I want to thank Phil Davidovich. Phil, will you raise your hand there? This is the guy, uh, my IREX colleague, who did all of the data analysis you're going to read and enjoy. And then uh, lastly, I really, really want to thank uh, the 94, I know it said 93, but it was actually 94, um, 94 leaders who took the time to speak with us. And as you'll see, um, we spent quite a lot of time with them. They were incredibly committed to their roles leading development organizations and also incredibly generous with their time and insights. Um, and I think we're all hopefully going to benefit from what they had to tell us. So let's dive into the research. And I do encourage you to take a look at the full report. I mean, this really only scratches the surface, this presentation. And if you go into it, you can see not only the summary, but also the data tables at the end, which actually tell their own story. Uh, so the methodology. We interviewed 94 leaders from NGOs, private sector development organizations, government agencies, not just the US, but several Western government agencies, foundations and corporations. We interviewed them, most of them for 30 to 45 minutes apiece. Um, so they're pretty meaty interviews. And we asked five open-ended questions, which are up here. And basically we were asking them how they see the world and how their own organization is adapting. Uh, now, before I present the data, I just want to emphasize this was not a scientific sample. We tried to have representation across different groups. Uh, and I also want to emphasize that these are the perceptions of leaders. George and I didn't neither opine on whether we agreed with them. We were very disciplined as researchers. Uh, and then also, uh, we didn't independently validate that they were right. This, these are merely the perceptions. Um, so take that into your thinking when you interpret the data. And uh, we had a goal of of encouraging reflection and debate among organizations in our sector. And our hope was that all of us will be stronger if we take the time to have those conversations. So what did we find? First of all, a really fragmented uh, development ecosystem. The actors, the issues, the funding, the approaches. You will see, if you look at those data tables in the back, 
Yes, there are areas of concentration in terms of the, what people told us, but there's a hugely long tail of issues that people mentioned only once or twice. So in some cases, more than half of the responses or half the responses were mentioned only once or twice. That shows massive fragmentation in the field. And similarly, when we asked about innovations and how people's own organizations were adapting, it really ran the gamut. Um, we can talk more in the Q&A about what that means, uh, but that's something, that's probably the number one takeaway. Another thing that really stood out when we finished the data, the surveys and started looking at the data is that one can only conclude on the basis of this survey that poverty is no longer the defining lens for global <coughs> development. Over the course of all, you know, all four of the questions, we, all five of the questions we asked, only 14 times was the word poverty mentioned. Um, we found that incredibly striking. And if we had given the survey three or four years ago even, I think we would have had a very different response. Now, interestingly, the rise of middle-income countries, and I know that that's a problematic term, so just bear with me on that. It was a term used by lots of our um, survey respondents. It was mentioned 2.5 times more often. Uh, with people talking about pockets of poverty, but looking at the rise of middle-income countries. But much more often, uh, people mention the issue of fragility as the defining lens through which they see poverty, or through the SC development. Um, and of course, it's deeply connected to poverty. But the idea is that you can't just look at poverty. You have to think about the complex ways it is interwoven with conflict and weak governance and a host of other issues. Migration was also mentioned 32 times. And both fragility and migration are clearly consuming both resources and mind share in the development world and sort of pushing to the side the issue of poverty. Uh, we heard a lot about the challenge of development in a two-tiered two world and this growing gap between rich and poor. Uh, we can talk more about that in the break. I published a Brookings blog on it. Um, it actually has very powerful implications for how we think about development as this gap widens. And it has some pretty severe consequences for development organizations like my own. We may need to make some choices. But again, we can get more into that later. We also heard a lot about the rising influence of geopolitics and national interests in terms of their influence on global development. China was mentioned 51 times. Uh, it was mentioned in many ways as a competitor, but also as a source of a lot of development energy and resources, and we shouldn't put that aside. Uh, but also there was recognition that China brings with it a set of values and a set of expectations for grantees that are very, very different from those from, say, USAID or, or DFID. Uh, populism and nationalism were also mentioned often and seen as being a, a th as threatening support for development. And that, of course, included the United States, but also extended to other countries around the world. We heard about a shifting development landscape. We heard about power diffusing in so many different ways. New actors transforming development, role of the private sector, 65 mentions, China, middle-income countries. We heard about the catalytic role of business and private finance, both as an investor and as a partner. Um, and this is, was seen as something um, quite not new because the private sector has played a role for a long time, but the people we interviewed said there'd really been a sea change in development where people have now accepted that private markets are the primary thing that lifts people out of poverty, and there is a lot of potential to further leverage the power of those markets. There are questions, by the way, about how development organizations do that, but again, so much to talk about. Uh, another thing we heard a lot about was so-called localization. And this trend had many elements to it. One is as that more and more countries come into middle income status through domestic resource mobilization, also known very loosely and unscientifically as tax taxation, because there are other sources of revenue too. But the idea is that local uh, partner governments around the world in developing countries not only have the resources to drive their own development, but they have the human capital, they have the potential, they have the legitimacy in many cases. And then also within those countries, and those of us who work in countries around the world uh, know this too, they're ever more capable 
local actors, both individuals and organizations, that are driving development in, uh, in very effective ways. Um, and this was seen as being something that the development leaders we talked to were very proud of, but also it raises some questions for some of us about, well, what's our role and what's our value added? Closing spaces for civil society and international NGOs was mentioned 23 times, and almost 10% of the people we interviewed volunteered this as a major challenge. And this wasn't just implementing organizations, but also funders, uh, because it presents a number of challenges for them as well. Most mentioned issues. Climate change, 46 mentioned. Uh, this was cited as the most neglected issue in international, de uh, uh, international development. Uh, one uh, participant captured this viewpoint saying, this is the Damocles sword that hangs over development and human progress. Uh, it was also cited less often as an area, as exciting area for progress, that a lot of innovation and movement was possible if people come to terms with the challenge. Youth populations got 41 mentions and are seen as both a challenge and an opportunity. Patrick and I, and, and also Henrietta, are uh, very strong in speaking out about the fact that we have the largest youth population in human history on the planet, concentrated in South Asia, Middle East, and Sub-Saharan Africa. This is an enormous transformational opportunity for international development, but we have to take it. Um, and there's a question about how quickly and well international development organizations and governments around the world are, are taking this opportunity. One uh, discrepancy we found when we looked at the demographic data is that, sadly, for those of us who are running organizations that do development work around the world, IREX and FHI 360, funders are not nearly as focused on this issue of youth populations as NGOs like ours. So if you walk away with one thing today, we'd really like to ask you to correct that area of focus. Um, Empowerment of women and girls and a focus on gender had 24 mentions, and that's a source of real optimism. People are proud. They say that our work is better because we put a gender lens on it. They see all of the uh, powerful effects of empowering women and girls, but also called attention to the fact that, that we still need to do much more. And much to this chagrin, I think, to some in this room, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, received only 24 mentions. That in and of itself should be a little bit shocking. You'd also be even more shocked to see how little multilateral organizations like the bank or the UN came up at all. Um, and this is a focus of energy for some. It channels resources, energies. Um, but a lot of people just really weren't focused on the SDGs, and especially in, in the NGO and the private contractor uh, community. So I'm just going to give you four quotes just to give you a little teaser about the richness of the data and in the interviews when you delve into it. Uh, people here talking about the perhaps the end of international development as we know it, fragile environments not getting resources, climate change swamping everything we do, and as someone said, where is the comprehensive plan to engage youth, having not found it yet? The single biggest issue we found <coughs> how to pay for international development. And this is a worry at many levels. Obviously, it's a worry for organizations that are doing development work, because how do we do our work without resources? Um, but it's also a worry because how is the work going to get done by anybody? How is it going to happen if there are no resources? Um, and you'll see that with 131 mentions, this was the top concern for leaders across organizations we mentioned. So it was most mentioned issue overall. There's fear and excitement about the future. Fear because how do you do what you're supposed to do and your, what your mission uh, demands that you do if you don't have the resources. Um, but also some excitement because there's also a lot of innovation and energy when it comes to development finance. There are a lot of new mechanisms and not a, a lot of new opportunities and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but there's also some fear because these new funding mechanisms require doing the work in a very, very different way, and leaders are not sure that they currently have the talent or the know-how to, to do that. Um, and there are also worries that certain types of development can fall through the cracks. I think I'm going to leave that to the Q&A because I, I know we're short on time, uh, but there are whole categories of development that may not be amenable to certain kinds of, uh, of funding. There's also broad dissatisfaction, uh, an area of complete unanimity that people feel that short-term project-based development funding does not lead to the best results. We all seem to agree on that, and yet that is a pr predominant way in which international development work gets done. Funding is always the biggest challenge. That's an illustrative quote. 
innovation and anxiety. Uh, and this is my last slide and then I'll wrap for now. First of all, technology. When we ask people, what are you excited about? What are the areas of innovation in your organization that you feel have the most promise? Technology came up as the top theme across organizations, regardless of size or sector, 95 mentions. But if you go to the list in your report, you'll see that we had almost as many different types of technologies mentioned as people we interviewed. Um, so everything from drones delivering humanitarian assistance to AI to genetic engineering of seeds, nobody seems to have any sense of like, what are the one, two, three types of technologies that will really transform development? Everybody has a different answer. So very interesting. And if you believe in markets, not everybody is going to be right, probably. Uh, new and or spreading funding models. So this, again, area of energy, but also um, some concern. A lot of volatility, development finance, earned income, impact investing, social entrepreneurship, domestic resource mobilization, and shared value models were only some of the ones that came up. We heard about the increased use of data, 56 mentions. Uh, and this is something that on one hand, people are really proud of, and they feel has brought a whole new level of rigor to the field of international development. But there's also a sense that it's still vastly underused. Um, it's underused by NGOs, it's underused by funders, there's not enough investment, there's not enough um, know-how in terms of how to really learn from and build on it. We could have a whole other conversation about the disincentives to share data and the obstacles to learning as a community. Again, we have so much to talk about. Uh, and then there's the issue of collaboration. This is something people are, again, excited about, see as an area of innovation, something that's necessary with 54 mentions. But interestingly enough, a lot of people talked about the obstacles. Not, not always the benefits. And on the uh, NGO side, a lot of people, we got a bit of an earful, George, I would say, about some of the challenges to working with partners, private sector partners, the timeline, the language, the expectations, just the logistics of it all. Um, and then on the funder side, interestingly enough, whether it was multinational corporations or foundations or impact investors, heard a lot of complaints about, it's really hard for us to find the right partners, guys. We are having a really hard time. Um, and it's a problem for us. So quite interesting. So last point um, here is that uh, there are also a lot of concerns. I mean, I would say even anxiety on the part of development organization leaders, especially those of us who are running real development projects on the, world, on the ground around the world. Uh, there were concerns about talent, uh, 39 mentions overall. And for me, the interesting thing was not just that talent is a concern. I mean, name an, a leader of any organization in any sector that doesn't say they go to bed every night worried about talent. Um, it went way beyond that, though. There was a sense that there is a true skills mismatch between the way development is heading and the talent base that many organizations have. So you think, for instance, of the BUILD Act and the opportunity to construct fairly complex private sector deals that leverage private capital but also have a strong development intent and the skill set that that requires and the language that must be used. And you think about the skill set that is used to execute a fairly traditional USAID project. Both are very important and complex skill sets. They are not the same. And how easy is it to retool from one to the other? TBD. And by the way, we heard this from government agencies and foundations and impact investing organizations, as well as from NGOs and private contractors. Business model came up 35 times. Um, you know, the fundamental basics of the business model and whether it works. That ought to get all of our attention in uh, those of us who are running development organizations. And the last thing I'll say is that we actually had to create a tag called relevance because the word relevance, <laughs> specifically the word relevance, was mentioned 18 times in the course of our survey, which you're, if you're interviewing 94 people for a brief period of time and you ask them a lot of open-ended questions and they worry about their relevance, uh, this frequently, I mean, for me, that was also a very striking finding. Um, so again, want to encourage you to read the report. There's a lot in there. I hope it gets a lot of valuable reflection and conversations going across the sector and beyond. Uh, but uh, I think we're really grateful to the people who are not just shared their time with us, but, but also doing this important work. And our ultimate goal in doing this was to support them. So thank you. Over to you, George. Thank you, Christine. Great presentation.
Those of you standing in the back, there are a handful of seats up front if you want to come up to the front. Um, well, I think you now have a good sense uh, where we got the title for this report from. And the development community, development, which is all about change, I don't think we think enough about our own change. And one thing this report <coughs> indicates <coughs> is that not only do we promote change, but we're in sort of a disruptive change ourselves. And, you know, my first question to the panel is how do they relate to this transition that's going on? I know all three of them know a lot about this because they are three of the 94 who we interviewed. So they've thought about it. They've contributed to the findings. And, you know, how does this transition impact on your organization if there's one thing out there that the development community should be focused on, should address, what is it? And each of the panelists could, could address these issues across the spectrum of the development field. But Henrietta, I would really like for you to focus on the international community and the global architecture. Uh, Patrick, you on the NGO community, and Rob, you on the private sector. Henrietta. Uh, thank you very much, George, and thank you, Kristen. Uh, it's a very interesting report, and so because this is the week where the spring meetings uh, for the World Bank are gathering, and you walk into the World Bank and the first word you see is poverty, the fact that it did not come up in this is actually a very interesting observation. But um, the world of development has become so much deeper and so much broader, and there are so many more actors that I think part of our challenge will be a couple of areas. So let me pick up on something, Kristen, that you talked about. Um, local ownership. So countries now really expect to set their own strategic plans, and they expect to guide the rest of us. Many of us have been used to doing the strategic plans for a country or for a ministry, but I think those days have really passed. So we have to realize that we are there to assist them, and that <coughs> means that one of our challenges is the time frame that we are working on. I think that we are often um, not fast enough so that a local government might have four months, five months to be able to plan a project, but that's it. They've got to then start implementing because their government is asking to do it now. The political requirements are that you get more results sooner. So the international community, and that's particularly the global institutions, are going to have to figure out ways to speed up their systems so that we can match the, the expectations of the local governments. The second area that I think is coming through very clearly is that the humanitarian to development actually is quite a separate world. And the budgeting comes through differently, the thinking, the human capital development is quite different. We do not cross-train many of our professionals in this. And as we are looking forward, the governments, the bilateral donors, are very <coughs> interested in helping us respond on humanitarian emergencies because their populists, the populist governments, are interested in helping in humanitarian situations. They are not necessarily thinking about long-term development. So who then is thinking about long-term development? It may be that it's going to be the legacy of the foundations and of private businesses that are going to be the long-term development. And that is a real shift in terms of humanitarian and development. And then lastly, uh, many of us are used to requesting donations from private individuals and private sector into our organizations, and then we go forth and do good work. I think that's changing. I think we have to think about shared value partnerships, that we're all going to a shared goal, but we may go on different routes. And it just <coughs> means that we have to think about our roles differently, and that's going to be a sea change for us, too. Thank you, Henrietta. Patrick. Those were great comments. Um, and this is a great report. Uh, I, I want to start with two comments about uh, this report. Oftentimes, research reports like this 
are good snapshots of a point in time. But the trends and the shifts that are described here, I think will have uh, quite a, a long shelf life because they're, they're shifts that, are, that will take place over a period of years. So I think this is going to remain a relevant um, piece of work. And it's, I was also struck by just how clearly it describes the, per, these perceptions and the consensus amongst, um, I think amongst the development community, at least uh, those people I interact with around these findings. So I, I think it's a really valuable piece of work. Just in terms of, you know, what does this shifting landscape mean for organizations, for civil society organizations and international development organizations that are non-governmental? Um, for us, it's really about adaptation. And it's adaptation on multiple levels simultaneously, which, which I think is different, qualitatively different than it's been in the past. So it's, it's adapting our business models. And one of those business models <coughs> is moving from a, a grant-seeking approach to a service selling and a shared value approach. Um, from a reactive approach, so waiting for a funder to say, I want to do this, who, who's a partner I can work with, to being able to say, here's a pressing need. We all have a stake in addressing this challenge. We have something valuable to offer, and then forging a partnership like that. So from reactive to proactive. So there's a change in business models. The cha changing business models requires changing your organizational structure. So, for example, I know we at FHI 360 and, and I know a number of other organizations are, I call it innovating our organization, but we're setting up special purpose, fit for purpose vehicles to work with foundations and corporations, to work with, to, to develop new product lines or new, new areas of operation, such as impact investing, because if there's more development financing that is going to be coming from the private sector, then we have to build the capacity within our own organization <coughs> to, to work with those funders and work in that world, in the investment world, to be a, 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 an effective partner to them. So in our case, we set up a subsidiary to do impact investing and part of it was just to build our own capacity, to develop our own understanding of that world um, so that in the future we can operate in that world. Um, so it's, as, you, as you adapt your business models, as you introduce new areas of operation and then stop investing in some old areas of operation because things become obsolete, that can be very difficult for an organization to come to grips with something that has made big contributions and to say, you know, it's, we have to move on from that. You also have to adapt your systems. And that's your, your personnel systems, your financial management systems, your information technology systems. Uh, data analytics for us is a big thing, so building out that capacity. And that's expensive, especially if you're operating at scale. It's, it, it's expensive, and it's not something that it's easy to get financing for. So it poses, I think one of the challenges reflected in here is the challenge of building these new systems and managing this change um, and finding, finding the resources to do that. Uh, new systems require new business processes at a very granular level, and it all takes a, a different kind of mindset because uh, disruption is uncomfortable and it requires being able to um, deal with that discomfort, get out of comfort zones and do new <coughs> things. And what, what I see now in our organization, and I'm sure it's not unique to us, is that we're doing this simultaneously. We're building new uh, organizations, we're putting in place new systems, and that's putting a tremendous amount of stress on the people in the organization. And my, um, I, I try to encourage people by saying, uh, 
um, we're fortunate to live in a time when we have these kinds of challenges that we can grapple with so that we can build an organization that can address the human development challenges of the future. You know, Patrick, somebody who read this report last week came to me and said, you must really be pessimistic, all of these. And I said, no, I'm optimistic because these 94 development leaders are very, they're not living on their past and they're not living on the successes. They're confronting the challenges and they're addressing them. And that makes me optimistic the way you are. Can I pipe in for a second Please. here, George? This was a fascinating thing about writing this study uh, arm in arm with George because George consistently was so impressed by what all of us in the development or running development organizations were doing to adapt. And I was coming back and saying, George, we have to adapt. It's not a choice. We're not being enlightened. And we're just, we have to. And so we have this different, really interesting dynamic throughout the course of the study. We actually had to keep changing the language a bit to capture accurately this reinforcing cycle of the benefits of having innovate and taking that opportunity and all the um, options that are available. But also, it's hard. It's hard, and our teams feel it. Our teams really feel it. And that's what Patrick is mentioning. Transparent in our in our inner debate that we had, <laughs> right. Rob. Well, I, <clears throat> I thought it was a, a, a fascinating uh, report. Uh, a little bit of a group therapy session for the development. <laughs> <community. Yeah. laughs> Everybody was on the couch, so to speak, and and it was particularly telling because there there basically are no clear answers about this. But um, but I'm here to represent the private sector. As everybody knows, there is no one private sector, no number you call that answers private sector and gives you all that great wisdom. Uh, it is rather a multitude of players who have varying degrees or levels of sophistication as it relates to development. And so I'm really focused as it relates to the private sector on those who are more sophisticated and do understand uh, something about development uh, objectives. I also am talking solely about business as opposed to other players in the private sector uh, who may be nonprofits or what have you. Uh, but the good news is those who are somewhat sophisticated, they, they uh, are, tend to be multinational corporations. They may be companies that have been involved in government programs like Feed the Future or Power Africa, or they may be members of the World Economic Forum and have been involved in conversations about the SDGs or S Sustainable Development Goals. They get it. Uh, and they represent really important, valuable partners uh, for the development community. And they're very open, I believe, by and large, to that. There are many questions I'll come to in a second, but they're very open to that. I think they're also thrilled uh, that there is this kind of growing realization that you cannot fight poverty sustainably, permanently, uh, without supporting uh, economic growth that's private sector driven and is built around around sound investment and employment and the like. Um, and so uh, there's kind of this all of a sudden, hey, they need us. They want us. They, they realize that we uh, can be a large part of the solution. And, uh, and I believe it is encouraging that, that you know, the development community gets this. And that's manifested in multiple answers. And they say over and over again, we know we can't get to the SDGs or anything short of that without significant engagement of the private sector. Um, having, having said all that, um, even among the, those who are sophisticated and those who are inclined to, to uh, take advantage of uh, the newfound availability, for instance, of, of credit and equity from development finance institutions, I'm very proud of the fact that our country is about to get uh, into the game in a much more aggressive, effective way with the implementation of the BUILD Act. Uh, and there's also growing recognition among the multilateral development banks uh, that they have to play uh, a more aggressive role, not just be uh, slightly less market focused than commercial banks. Uh, so risk taking uh, is something that does matter and there's increasing pressure on these institutions to take greater risk. Okay, having said that, though there, there's just some very basic questions and concerns quite honestly, that many businesses have, even those who get it in terms of development. First and foremost, and this is, I mean, I, I'm sorry you have to say this, but I think people have to be reminded of this, uh, 
you know, the companies want to make sure that their partners in the public sector or in the non-governmental uh, sector uh, who are, you know, going to work with them on collaborations related to development understand their first objective is to make money. It's not to fight poverty. And people lose sight of that fact. You know, they're kind of like, why aren't you doing this? Well, because we lose money doing that. And frankly, we'll go out of business if we keep doing that. So you just have to keep that in mind. Fortunately, there's no question but that you can make money and do good. And that's the point. Second, and these, uh, this is a question I've heard multiple times. Is there a single set of standards that describe precisely what constitutes good development versus not so good development, or sustainable development, which of course is one of those terms that's now ubiquitous but is not clear how it's always used, uh, versus not so sustainable. Is there a standardized way to measure impact? Question I hear all the time. And one of the dangers is, I've been to meetings, particularly at like the OECD, where there are not just a set of standards, there are tens of sets of standards. And as a business, and you're looking at this thinking, you know, even if you're not a huge multinational corporation, you can't allocate significant resources to do nothing but try to parse through all the different standards and pick which one is the one I'm supposed to abide by. So these are things that I think those of us in the development community, and I'm sort of between both, we have to be mindful of and try and help answer those questions. And finally, a very simple question, but again, the one that needs to be kept in mind, you know, can I cooperate if I'm a company? Can I cooperate with my friends in the development community on initiatives that are, are not going to become too onerous, too, too bureaucratic, too filled with forms we have to fill out or information we have to provide we don't want to provide? So, um, but I'm also convinced that, that the companies that do have a level, level of sophistication, they want to see more collaboration. And this came up over and over again, and it's really important, partly because they don't want to be nickel and dime to death with different development organizations coming to them and saying, we have this project or that project. Well, what's the best project? What's the right project? What's the successful project? The companies don't know that, and we have to help sort through that, I think. But I do believe they are interested in being more developmentally impactful and being more effective. And that's, that's something we can take advantage of. Last thing I want to say is I talked about the companies that are more sophisticated. The vast majority of companies that are getting into the international uh, economic environment or world uh, are not sophisticated. They have no clue what the objectives of the development community is, nor whether or not their simple effort to be good, solid citizens that are going to try to make a profit in a country are aligned with the development objectives of the development community. I think they'd find they're extraordinarily well aligned, but they don't know it. So there's a huge amount of information sharing and data sharing and example sharing that has to take place among new players getting into the international environment about what is, what is sustainable development, how can we align your legitimate for-profit interest with uh, our objectives without turning you on your head. Thanks, Rob. Before I move on to my next big question of the panel, I can't let Rob's comments pass with Henrietta here. Without a quick comment, Henrietta, I know you've made a priority of partnering with the private sector and UNICEF. And give us a minute on how that's going. Uh, well, so in line with the guidelines on how do you, how do you um, work with a company how, the, how do they know what's good development? So we take it from a child's point of view. So a child is an ultimate development uh, actor. So if you think about um, the first two decades of life, if as a company you can look at them and say that something you are doing, a product, a service, a platform, is good for a child, then you know it's going to be good for development. So at least that's our lens. It's simple, but it seems to work with a lot of companies. Uh, we are now trying to do the changeover from just being um, receiving donations into being shared value. And what we get are the questions that Kristen comes up with, which is, how do our skills align? How do we do that? So we're starting to do video seminars. We like guest speakers, but people who have seen both worlds but 
everybody is seeing, that they don't spend enough time with the private sector, with businesses. We spend lots of time talking to government, we spend a lot of time talking to nonprofits, and we don't spend the time with businesses. So if all of us in this room get out and talk to the businesses, as Rob was saying, that will make a big difference. And it's just, it's how we spend our time. Time is undervalued in most of our systems. We measure results, we measure people, we mm -hmm. measure funding outflows, but we don't measure time. But if you, if you think of spending the same amount of time with private sector, I think we will begin to change. Good. So one of the big findings that came through <clears throat> in the survey was the leaders seeing the developing world dividing in two, bifurcating between those countries which are successful or moving their populations out of poverty, <clears throat> entering middle class status, and those that are being left behind in conflict and instability and fragility. Um, how does this impact on UNICEF? How do you maneuver through this world? And uh, are you having to run two different organizations because of the nature of the developing world today? George, it's a great question and it's a puzzle for all of us. So a country like Yemen is going backwards. And so we are trying desperately to hold this country together and to make sure that there's clean water that there's sanitation, that there's enough food for the people, the schools, at least half of the schools are open, the health clinics and hospitals are open. Um, it is conflict and it's violence around the world that tends to break down the countries and their march toward better development, so they fall back. What I think is unifying is, um, you won't be surprised by this, the private sector, the businesses, in every country, no matter how fragile, there is a private business community. And if we can touch base with it, if we can get them motivated to help bring up their country, it will make an enormous difference. So private sector is one. I think technology, what Patrick was talking about with innovation is another one. So for instance, we're looking at um, digital connectivity for schools. Mm -hmm. And is it possible to connect every school in the world? Um, if it is possible, it just means there will be different learning systems. When satellites are sent up, it means that several countries at a time can be covered. They're not all the same. So one might be fragile, one might be um, in sort of the middle stage in development, and one might be extremely well developed but the satellite covers all and they will have the capacity for having education systems in each of these countries that match. When we do other uh, regional programs, like I was just in the Democratic Republic of Congo looking at our Ebola programs, the fact that the DRC is looking at Ebola, but so is Uganda, so is Rwanda, they all share ideas and thoughts, so it crosses over. So technology leaps the divide, the private sector businesses leap the divide. Uh, and I think all of us with our knowledge, we can leap the divide. And it's going to be very important to knit our world back together again. And that's certainly one of the aims for UNICEF. So Rob, Henrietta has brought the private sector into this conversation. Yeah. And I was gonna ask you, so it's a nice lead in. Um, obviously the private sector is, is is investing and engaging in business with these middle-income countries. But what is the potential for the private sector in these fragile countries? Yeah. And does it require a government subsidy to de-risk it? Well, one of the few advantages of doing business in high-risk countries is the old axiom, um, high risk, high reward. And, and there are plenty of examples of where companies that, that took risks that frankly 99% of the other companies wouldn't take, uh, end up reaping great rewards because they're on the ground and, and they're first movers. But that's not a good strategy for, uh, for trying to develop uh, fragile states or getting economic activity going. So the answer is I think it takes uh, real significant commitment from other players, particularly public sector players. And so there are a variety of tools that can facilitate this, all of which the new United States Development Finance Corporation will have, but does not have today, by and large. Uh, and those things include, for instance, uh, small grant authority and technical assistance. There are so many projects uh, in countries that, that you know, are sort of this close to the finish line, but they run out of money. 
Uh, they need some piece that will ultimately make the project financeable, but they can't afford it. Uh, or they need something to scale just a little bit, but they, they're out of money. Uh, so the technical assistance or, or, uh, or small grant authority can be extraordinarily vital in moving those projects to a point where they have a much better chance of getting finance. Second, private equity authority or equity authority. I mean, today, you know, OPIC does not have equity authority. It does some things that look very much like equity, uh, but it doesn't have that. And so many of these projects in fragile states are going to be starved for capital. Uh, and so they don't need just debt. They need equity. And uh, the Global Innovation Fund, for instance, is an example of an entity that is trying to address these specific gaps. Third would be first loss. And uh, first loss basically is sort of a, almost a, a, a shock absorber on the front end of a highly risky transaction. Uh, I used it very sparingly uh, at, when I was at OPIC, and it wasn't OPIC's because uh, although the new USDFC will have first loss capability, we didn't have it. Uh, we, we would go out and ask other uh, development agencies if they would be willing to invest. Uh, I think it can be used very effectively as long as it doesn't become something that gets blown through quickly. It usually can help leverage other capital. So if you're a senior lender or a lender in a project and you think the first 10, 15, 20 percent of loss on a deal is going to be absorbed by that first loss commitment before you have to start paying up, well, that, that I think encourages you to get uh, to get into the, to the transaction where you might not otherwise. Now, one other thing I want to mention, George, the MDBs, multilateral development banks, who, uh, whether it's the IFC or, or the Asian Development Bank, the African Development Bank, all have very good reasons why they don't lend uh, in these places, by and large. Now, some of them are making extraordinary efforts, but by and large, they don't lend much in there. And the answer they say is, one, these transactions are too small. We don't have the capacity to evaluate them on the ground, to track them, to do the due diligence, blah, blah, blah. That's, a, that's one explanation you get. The other is high risk and likelihood that we're going to have uh, something on our portfolio that's going to go south. And we, don't, we can't afford to have many bad transactions on our portfolio without the rating agencies deciding to downgrade us, which is a fate worse than death. I don't happen to think that's a very viable uh, proposal, or at least excuse because their portfolios are huge. And these, de these transactions, by definition, are very, very small. Mm -hmm. But notwithstanding that, there are others, one of whom is Nancy Lee, and others at, at uh, Consensus for Development, uh, our uh, CDG, as well as, as working with uh, George and I, wrote a paper, and we talked about uh, creating a special purpose vehicle that's funded uh, off balance sheet to which MDBs could contribute. You could have blended finance, which is a really important component of dealing with these high-risk places where some philanthropic money or nonprofit money can come in and take some of the additional risk. Uh, and you create a pool of, say, $200 million of a special purpose vehicle lending uh, where it's specifically aimed at these type situations. And the expectation is basically capital preservation. In other words, you're going to get back enough money to cover the money you have in it. Rob, which is what AID and DFID did with the Global Innovation Fund. Right, exactly. So, so I mean, there, there are tools out there. We have to make a commitment. Both the development finance institutions have to decide to go lower, and I think the U.S. development finance institution is going to go lower down the pyramid, and the MDBs have to make that commitment, uh, or we're going to leave a large part of the truly poor behind, and that gap you're seeing is going to get wider. Good. Thank you. So, Patrick and Kristen, how does this bifurcation affect you all? And are you having to run two different organizations, <clears throat> middle-income countries versus the fragile states? <clears throat> and, Patrick, do you actually have the capacity to be adaptive given the constraints that your funders put you under? Yeah. And I think the adaptability is particularly important in those fragile countries. It is. Well, it's, it's important everywhere, but uh, first I want to say that I think it's an accurate description of the world that we live in, that we see this bifurcation, and that if you're an organization like ours, where our mission is to promote human welfare, then we ask ourselves, where are the greatest needs, and where are the needs going to be in the future? And we see that the greatest needs right now, and in the 
in the looking forward, say, five to ten years, are going to be in crisis-affected countries. And with climate change, and we saw what happened in Mozambique last month, which, mm. uh, and um, in, in the Sahel, you have climate generated conflict. In Mozambique, you had this big natural disaster because of the cyclone. So um, we see that that's going to be an area where that will drive us um, to be relevant and that we have real value to add because if you, we look at our capacities as an organization, um, we think we have to step up and make a contribution in addressing those challenges. Uh, but it does require um, different approaches. And so we do, we don't have two different organizations. It's, I liked your uh, comment about um, uh, leaping the divide. And what we see is how do we take the capacities we have within our organization and apply them to different types of need in different geographies. And then uh, try to get as much synergy um, as we can find. So we do have, for working in crisis-affected countries, we're also working on Ebola in the DRC. We're working in Yemen. We're working in northern Nigeria. Um, that requires a, a, a different kind of personnel management, different, really different kinds of people. <laughs> It requires different methods. The risk profile is very different. Different types of support from the organization. We've put a huge investment, for example, into safeguarding so that we know that in the communities that we're working in, that we're not uh, in, um, inadvertently contributing to risks in, the, in those communities. So it's required us to build out a whole new set of capacities, but we're in doing that, we're, we're looking at how do we use the, the knowledge, the experience, the technical expertise within the organization so we can uh, deploy it um, in a fit-for-purpose model. So if we're deploying it in a more traditional development context where countries are becoming more sophisticated, they're building new systems, we have a lot to offer, and I think the, the, the um, civil society in general has a lot to offer to help, um, to help contribute to that progress. Um, at the same time, we can, we can deploy capacity and resources to address uh, these crisis situations, um, but it requires a different mode of operating. Mm -hmm. Question? Yeah, thanks, George. I, I'm going to say something very, very briefly about the, how to answer your question from the perspective of the development community, from this perspective of NGOs generally in the sector, and then something about how IREX is responding, which I think has implications for others. Uh, with respect to the development community, this issue of bifurcation or two worlds, um, I do want to echo something that Henrietta said, and it is something we heard from the leaders we surveyed. You know, I think historically there has been this divide between humanitarian relief organizations and organizations focused on long-term transformational development. They've been different organizations, they've had different areas of specialty, uh, but many people uh, said what, what Henrietta has just said, which is we need to break down this divide and knit these two together. And it's not just in terms of bringing these societies closer together in terms of their uh, human well-being, uh, but also in terms of bringing the approach approaches together. So when you have a humanitarian situation that is not a fairly brief reaction or, or a set of consequences to a specific act like a natural disaster, but rather is a very protracted, very complex uh, challenge, you really need to start bringing in that development perspective. When you're talking about children who are out of school in a place like Yemen or a place like DRC, where they're out of school, not just for, for months or even a year, but perhaps for their entire schooling career. That's a fundamentally different problem, and we would all be better off if we saw these approaches knit more together and saw um, the organizations and the whole community taking a broader, longer-term view. So that is an area of real potential, I think.
Um, from the perspective of NGOs broadly working across this sector, I, I do really see a challenge here between the most being able to work in the most extreme complex situations in these middle income countries. And there are a couple of issues here. Um, one is that the cost structure. The capabilities and the operational capacity you need to have as an organization that can sustain operations for many years in the most dangerous environment, the kind of personnel you need to have, there's a lot of burnout, uh, there's some things in the report about this. That's a very high cost um, organization that has a very particular skill set. On the other end of the spectrum, we see all this innovation and opportunity in terms of new financing mechanisms, working with the private sector, leveraging private capital. They need to be very agile, very low cost. The value added for international organizations, you know, your cost structure has to be a lot leaner. You need a different talent pool. So I do feel it's not an insurmountable challenge, but it is a tension. Um, my prediction would be that we will continue to see a lot of innovation. You know, I think Patrick has talked about FHI 360, what, F, what that organization is doing. Others are trying to innovate in that space. But, I think the reason we're seeing innovation is because there is a fundamental tension. Personally, I don't think everyone's going to make it. I think we will see fewer in number sort of all-purpose organizations that are all doing everything. And instead, I think what we'll see is maybe a very good thing, which is we'll see organizations really start to specialize in what they do the best um, and not try to do it all. That's an open question. But I think it will have big consequences for our sector and how we interact with each other. Um, from an IMRX perspective, we tend not to work in the most extreme environments. We're an organization that invests in people and their capacity to thrive. We invest in people and institutions. Um, and we tend to work more in the kind of countries that, frankly, there are a lot more of now. So on one hand, from an IREX perspective, we, with our human development, invest in people approach, look at the world and say, wow, the world is coming in our direction. Focus on civil society and good governance and education and youth engagement and women's empowerment and social inclusion. That's core IREX. We are, we are, and we are ready. Um, but as I said, the funding may not always be going there. Um, but I think one of the things that that we look at is that we should stop thinking about the developed world and the developing world because that division is increasingly irrelevant. Um, so because I happen to write something that I think was correct, I will cite a past art article I wrote. You should always do this um, if, if you actually were right once. Uh, but about three and a half years ago, I published a piece called, in foreign policy called The Fragility Within. And I said a lot of the focus in development was on fragile states. But what the real problem of our time is, one of the problems of our time, is the fragility within developing countries, within these middle-income countries. And all of us have this in common. Whether you are Nigeria or Pakistan or the United States or Belgium, we have areas of our countries that are thriving and doing well, but also marginalized populations, youth trapped in unemployment. We have problems of inclusion. We have problems of governance. We have problems of social cohesion and legitimacy. These are problems we all share. So at IREX, and I think other organizations are doing this too, one one of the things we're trying to do is look more broadly across the portfolio and say, where do we have areas of deep expertise that we can bring to communities no matter where they are? So for instance, I'll give very briefly the issue of information literacy this in media literacy. This is a huge issue, whether in your U Ukraine, different, uh, dealing with the challenge of propaganda, whether you're in an Arab state dealing with the challenge of extremist propaganda, whether you're in a country that's about to have an election and is overwhelmed with fake news, you name it. Whether you are in Kenya or India or Indonesia or Myanmar or the United States or Italy, this is a huge challenge of our time. So what we're doing is trying to invest in approaches and tools that, yes, need to be adapted to these different audiences, these different contexts. But how do we have a unified learning agenda so we can be constantly iterating and, frankly, moving a lot faster than the traditional development models where you do a project, you do the M&E, you report on it, and you move on to the next project? We're actually thinking about some very agile management structures where we're constantly iterating and learning against our own learning agenda, even as we're sending reports back to a whole bunch of different donors, whether they're in the private sector, or other governments, uh, and so on. Uh, and by the way, we're also piloting this work in the United States right now, which is something that also came up in the report. You'll see the breakout down of how many development NGOs are actually working in the United States today. Good.
So we're going to have one rapid round here before I turn to the audience and turn it over to you. Um, and the question is, what surprised you most in the report? And what are you most excited about in your organization? One minute apiece, except for Kristen, who only gets 30 seconds, because we already know what, what surprised her in the report. <laughs> and Rob, you can talk from any one of your multiple organizations, so you'll have to make a choice. <laughs> Kristen. Oh, gosh. The only one I prepared in my head was the one you took off the table. So I, I'm going to back up and, and, and take that one. One of the things that surprised me in the report is, um, yes, I, I currently run IRAX, but I, the last organization I was at was the United States Institute of Peace. Um, and I was actually shocked by how little issues of peace and conflict came up in the survey. If you look at the drivers of poverty, the drivers of fragility, the drivers of underdevelopment, they are often <coughs> the result of conflict and a lack of peace. And so the, for me, I put poverty up there because that's what everybody else thought. Um, that shocked me too. But um, also one of the shocks to me was how little that issue came up. Also the issue of corruption. Did you see corruption up there? Look at the data tables at the end. Again, I think this is one of the great uh, forces that's chewing away at development progress, and it wasn't there. So sorry to punt on that, George, but they always taught me to answer the question you, you <laughs> want to or are prepared to, not the one you were asked. So I was trained well at Brookings. Rob? Um, well, I would take maybe a slightly different uh, perspective on the issue of, of poverty seeming to, to have uh, diminished in terms of the focus. I would say to the development community, and, and I'm not telling people anything they don't already know, we have something to celebrate in terms of great progress. A billion people moved out of, billion, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a billion people moved out of poverty. But for most of the world, you're talking about moving people from <coughs> living on $2 a day to 5 or 10 That's, for most of us, that's still extreme poverty. So even though we're making this bifurcation issue one of great concern, and we should, let's not lose sight of the fact that to most of the public, including the American public, these people are desperately poor. And we just need to keep focused on we're helping poor people, and that includes those in middle-income countries who can be just as poor as people in, in low-income countries. Mm -hmm. Good. That's a great point. Thanks for making that point. Um, here's something that surprised me in the report, and I know you're re we're reporting on the perceptions of, uh, of uh, people that you spoke with, but the report seems to characterize international NGOs um, as sort of based in the U.S. or maybe based in Europe and sending out Americans and, and expatriates to work in countries. And that, I don't believe that at all de characterizes or describes what international NGOs look like. And I, I can give us as an example, we have offices in 45 countries, and I think there's only one that is headed by an American, and that American, and that's our regional office in Bangkok. And she has lived in Asia, in different countries in, in, the, in that region, since the 1980s, continuously. So, um, so international NGOs really have become a part of the fabric of the countries and the regions where they operate. Our staff are, are almost exclusively, our leaders and our technical you know, directors are almost exclusively either from the country or from the region. And we're also, I was, as I was thinking about it, I realized what a force we are for South-South cooperation. So you hear a lot about the importance of South-South cooperation. And I was thinking, okay, our director in, U in uh, Zimbabwe is from Uganda. Our director in Nigeria is from Nepal. Our head of global health is from South Africa. And I could just go across the, the, the head, the director in Cote d'Ivoire is from Rwanda. That, that there, because we um, cultivate, mentor, and develop leaders and technical specialists, they, they then go on to become um, leaders within our organization around the world. And you, it really becomes a facilitator for South-South cooperation that I don't think we get credit for. It certainly didn't come out in this report. 
And I, I do think it's a mischaracterization to think of INGOs as somehow reflecting just the values of the country where they're based. They really, um, I know, uh, taking us as an example, but I know we're not unique, that we, we reflect the values and the, um, and the expertise and the, the, the social capital, the knowledge of the countries where we operate. You should, you should create a picture of that globalization of FHI yeah. 360, it'd be fascinating. And I just want to add, and briefly, Patrick, I'm so glad you mentioned that. I think it's an excellent point. It's a huge change we've seen in the sector. To be fair to the people who answered the survey, I actually think that this is the model for most development organizations, and FHI 360, I think, is a great example. But we did hear that uh, kind of across the board. Um, there is still seen to be this distinction between international NGOs and local NGOs, but you're absolutely right, and the others, uh, 93 people we interviewed, I think would actually agree with you. Uh, so, so just building on this last point, uh, one of the things you notice when you're in the United Nations is also how you're building the capital of the ministers and the ministries mm -hmm. in these countries. It's extraordinary what we as a community have come <clears throat> to learn together. So, so when we're thinking about our own selves, what we're developing, but it's also the ministries, it's an international community. So what I was most surprised about in the report that was not mentioned is because young people mention it as a really big issue for them. And some of you can probably already guess what it is, but it's violence. It's violence at home, in school, online, in their communities. So I was surprised mm -hmm. that it didn't come out more strongly. Mm -hmm. They really want our help. They are really concerned about mental health. As you know, most of the mental health problems start by age 13 or 14. So you have to catch them when they're young. But I was surprised at that. Um, what I was really delighted about and excited about was so many mentioned youth. Um, we just launched uh, Generation Unlimited at the last UN General Assembly. A lot of organizations here are dealing with youth. But we need 10 million jobs a month. Young people are saying they're not getting educated well enough to make a livelihood for themselves. And they're really worried. And they're afraid that there aren't going to be jobs. And we actually know there aren't going to be jobs. A lot of them are going to have to be entrepreneurs. Uh, a lot of them are going to have to be trained. And we're going to have to train them when they're in secondary school. So for this, the future of how technology and young people come together in the world to come is going to be really important. And maybe some of it is digital education. And it was mentioned in the report. I think education is going to be terrific. It's going to have a whole renaissance, and I was delighted to see it in the report. So thank Very you. Very good. All right. Over to you. Um, we'll take three questions, and um, before we do, is there one question for Henrietta before she has to run? And there's a microphone someplace. Okay, no specific. Right here. Hold on one second. My name is Nancy Wilson. I'm with Relief International, and we really focus on fragile settings. So I want to know how can we support you to get the funding models to change? Because we have long-term fragility, and the funding models are so short-term, you really can't invest in the young people the way that we need to. And we're constantly getting the rug pulled out from under us because the funding um, scenarios change. But in Yemen or with refugees, I mean, you know, Somalia, South Sudan, these are long-term challenges of investing in young people. And to be the one additional party that shows up in their lives and then disappears too soon is, is never a good strategy. Um, exactly. That's, that's absolutely right on point. So we can talk more about this, but it's based on what Rob said. If we can do public-private platforms, we can make up for each other. So one might be short term and one might be long term and one might be medium term, but we'll all have different sources of income. So platforms like Generation Unlimited that are public and private, they're every country in the world, there are as many of you as want to join, I think they're going to be the wave of the future because they will try to um, plant the seeds of development in the humanitarian crises. Because for a child, they have no difference between a crisis and development. It's their lives. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. And uh, we should talk more about that. And look up Genu online. We're all part of it. Thank you. As Henrietta walks out, thank you, Henrietta. Thank you, Henrietta. I want to thank Henrietta.
you can, you can imagine what her schedule is like this week. And thank you for making the time, but thank you also from everybody here for your leadership on all of these issues, which you demonstrated last week so dramatically. And for anybody who wants to, uh, Rich, some of people will be interested to know that she's accompanied by Rich Green, who uh, many people in this room know. Thanks, Rich. Okay. Um, we've got two questions right here. Hi. Uh, my name... My name is Aman Khanna, and um, I, I work with some social enterprises uh, in South Asia, helping them raise capital from, from, from the developed world. I've worked, you know, arranged a couple of loans uh, from OPEC uh, for, for a couple of Indian com country, uh, companies. Uh, I, was, I had a question for you, uh, Robert. I, I was very glad that you mentioned uh, blended finance and the fact that different return-seeking capital can come together in the form of a first clause and to, to attract and crowd in more and more private capital. And clearly, the, the new development bank, uh, the, the transition that OPEC is undergoing is, is very encouraging in that regard. I wanted to ask you what more, because at the end of the day, OPEC is U.S. Treasury. There's a much larger pool of capital perhaps sitting in the, in the, in the, in, in private, in the larger private sector. What more can be done to, to get that unlocked for what, is, what could still, with blended structures, be good return for, for the pension funds, for example, if it's blended with... And the other part of that question is, in emerging markets, in the recipients of, of such capital, there, what would you like to see change, uh, policies and otherwise, to, to kind of, you know, let this, the floodgates open for, for this capital, this kind of capital? Thank you. Okay. There's a second question right there. I should ask it now. Okay. Um, my name is Julie. I'm with the organization Core Africa, which facilitates a Peace Corps-like opportunity for college-educated Africans to serve in their own countries. Um, so Core Africa follows this trend, Kristen, that you mentioned of smaller scale, more localized, and less one-size-fits-all projects. So my question is about monitoring and evaluation and um, impact evaluation. These more localized human development projects that are longer term um, make monitoring and evaluation more challenging. And I was wondering if you see expectations and practices on M&E um, and how we evaluate success shifting in the future. And pass the microphone over to, the, to your right, to the lady right there. Hello. My name is Beatriz Nofal. I was former Argentina Sherpa, and I have a question for Robert. Uh, basically, I was very interested in the proposal of creating a special purpose vehicle where MDBs can contribute. If you can explain a little bit more about that. Uh, thank you very sure. much. Right. Rob, you want to take on that first question, and then we'll move along? Sure. So, um, of course, the idea of creating a special purpose vehicle that would be off balance sheet uh, is so that even if you believed that the IFC would suffer greatly from having a higher loss incidence than it currently has, <clears throat> which I don't happen to think it would suffer greatly because it's got a huge portfolio and it's, got, it's making a lot of money. Um, but if you accept that premise as we have to address that, then to move the SPV or create an SPV and move, it, move the funding off balance sheet for contributing uh, banks would help. And the idea would be to have uh, a vehicle that, in essence, was governed by pro rata, the contributors. And the contributors could be not just the IFC or the Inter-American Development Bank or whomever, but also could be uh, the Gates Foundation. Uh, it could be, you know, other players who, who want to uh, participate in something higher risk. And frankly, you know, don't find many vehicles to participate that have that high risk and fragile state. So, and what I meant by, by capital uh, preservation is you go in assuming uh, that the returns are probably going to be single digit and quite possibly low single digit, and you hope that out of a combination of, of investments, and you know, it's always smarter to have a portfolio of investments than it is to put all your eggs in one or two baskets, that you'll get to the point where you're covering, in essence, the cost of your capital. And so that's what we have in mind. 
And, and the, the criteria for investment would be a lot like what you know, George was talking about. I mean, fragile states where you know, capital is very hard to come by, and yet there are, there are uh, projects and players that uh, you can be comfortable investing with. So that's kind of the way it would work. I'll be happy to take the second one. Um, so first of all, I have a bit of a different perspective. I think we see a lot of innovation and adaptation by both international and local NGOs. So I don't think I'd use a phrase one size fits all. Um, I don't think that's an approach that most NGOs of any size that I work with would take. Um, but in terms of the challenges of M&E, um, I think you saw in the report that there is this real embrace of the need for measurement and evaluation, the need for impact data, the need for learning across the sector. I think that's a huge positive advance. Um, but I also think there's starting to be a recognition that there is something between the M&E you do for your individual project that you give to your donor and a full RCT, which is very expensive, more very long term. And so what I'm starting to hear about are more experiment more experimentation with our M&E that falls somewhere in the middle between those things. And I think there's still a lot of room for innovation there because RCTs aren't appropriate for every project, not just because of the cost, uh, but also because of the complexity. Um, and also, they're just not practical in terms of short-term learning and iteration. Uh, but they're not. that's not the only approach. It's sort of known as a gold standard. But I think we're going to start seeing more and more um, innovation to give us some rigorous learning that, that falls short of that gold standard. Um, and again, I think that's a very positive thing. And that's going to help the whole sector, including the local NGOs that you're mentioning. And just to answer the first question. So as you probably know, OPIC has no marketing staff of consequence. And yet now we have a fully tooled uh, development finance institution that really dramatically needs to raise its profile, partly to develop a pipeline of projects from which you can pick the most worthy. I mean, you don't want 10, 000, or, or $10 billion worth of projects uh, that you have to spend $10 billion on. You want $10 billion worth of applications that you can maybe pick five or two or three. Um, so there has to be serious business development and, and kind of uh, increased awareness around the United States, but also because the development finance uh, institution that we're creating has no longer an absolute requirement on the U.S. nexus. So in other words, whereas 25 percent of the equity under OPIC's rules today must be American, uh, and if an American's interested in the post-OPIC uh, new DFC, strong preference will be given to those Americans. But if there's no American, you can go do the deal. So that suggests you need to build uh, support for applications from other parts of the world where there's not as much of a probability you'll have an American investor. The other part is, and what I think is really exciting is, the way we're going to draw in larger pools of capital like pension funds is to have a broad enough, a wide enough portfolio of projects where you've spread the risk around. So if you have 10 projects, let's just say infrastructure projects, power projects, in a portfolio, and three of them, frankly, don't perform very well, but you know, they're, not, they're not out of business necessarily, or one or two, uh, because the other seven perform, well, you can cover those losses. You're, in effect, cross-subsidizing. So the way we get there, though, uh, is not just by USDFC doing a lot more. It's the USDFC teaming up with other DFIs or other multilateral development banks to do more. And we have now removed the biggest impediment to why other development finance institutions in Europe and Asia wouldn't team up with, with OPIC, and that is because OPIC was always in its senior secured debt and came out first, and that made everybody else angry. And so we've taken that out, and we're no longer the skunk at the party. So now we ought to be pursuing very aggressively co-lending, co-investing with our DFI friends. And the more critical mass you develop, the more you spread the risk, the more you attract capital from pension funds, I think. And that can be transformative in terms of capital going into these markets. Patrick? Um, you know, on this point, one of the things that I've observed is you have a, um, a lot of investors, foundations and uh, private equity funds that have been formed in the last few years to do social impact investing. And so it's a, it's a popular trend. But there's not a lot of disbursement of, of the 
uh, of the funds into actual activities. So our assessment is that the real uh, bottleneck, the real constraint, is the availability of really good investments to, to make, good yeah. activities, yeah. good business cases to, to invest in. <clears throat> and as I'm looking at it now, like with the new USDFI, I think that that will be great for infrastructure investments. And we've seen, you know, with China investing in infrastructure. So there's been, in the last 10 years, a, a lot of investment, a lot more investment going into infrastructure. Finally, it was a crying need. The U.S. will now get into that game. But those are going to be, the ticket size on those investments is going to be giant. It's going to be, I, I'm expecting it will be starting ticket size in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And, you know, to your question about how do you unlock uh, investment into emerging markets, I think that for the big size investments in big infrastructure or maybe, you know, some big uh, business, uh, commercial businesses in large countries where there's large markets, that we're going to see more funding available because those vehicles are, are being put into place. But for the smaller, the medium size, that missing middle that we've talked about for 20 years, I don't, I'm disappointed that the whole move to impact investing hasn't really developed the, the investment vehicles, the, invest, the kinds of investment funds that target those medium to small size businesses in emerging markets. And, and I, I think that the, the main issue is that they can't find it. Not, it's not that there's no money, and it's not that the people managing those funds don't want to invest it. It's they can't find the investments where the risk, is, the risk profile justifies them putting, putting the money in. That's, that's my assessment. Yeah. Well, I think there's a danger of that. Particularly, uh, you know, people have said to me, so was the fundamental reason why uh, the BUILD Act was passed in response to China? Was it all about infrastructure? And, you know, there's no question that what China's been doing in terms of its development strategy has added a sense of urgency about we have to have a counter narrative that we're comfortable with. Um, but I don't believe for one second that the new USDFC is going to be inordinately focused on, on infrastructure. That's good news. And, and the reason I believe that is because, you know, when I ran the agency three and a half years, uh, we had a very robust SME program, small and medium-sized enterprise program, that continues to be uh, a very vital part of this. And when you add the Development Credit Authority of USAID, you're bringing on board both a psychology or a culture as well as a legitimate pipeline of development of deals at the mission level that are going to be, by definition, fairly small mm -hmm. that can fit that profile. That ought to be part of the profile. And I think, you know, we shouldn't just have these great projects at the high end and then a few where we've taken some private equity uh, and invested half a million or a million here and there in 20 projects. We ought to have this missing middle addressed squarely. And I think we can. I, I really think we can. I think OPIC has great experience at that. Uh, and I think it now has better tools right. to help those entities get off the ground and stay off the ground. Good. Um, one more question, the lady back at the back. Hi, I'm Nancy Lubin. I um, had, for the last 25 years, I've headed a research and consulting group, JNA Associates Inc., that has worked on well over 85 um, contracts and grants and projects, um, but almost entirely in the former Soviet Union, but designing, implementing, and doing really all steps of the way. Um, I have to mention, by the way, I got up into this in 1978 when IREX gave me a grant to go do my doctoral research for a year in Uzbekistan as the only American for 2,000 miles in every direction. So I wasn't so happy with it then, but I'm so grateful to you now. <laughs> but, uh, but I wanted to follow up on the monitoring and evaluation. With all the projects we've worked on, not just with the evaluations, but with the with the proposals and the design and the implementation in the field and then the evaluations, everything has been directed 
towards looking good for our funders. And of course, we would give them one evaluation, but we would keep the real one that we could learn from the next time. But the donors focused on aid we're focused on very different things than it seems your current donors, you know, your current partners will be now. So I'm curious, with, with this new kind of framework, will you be able to share those real evaluations with them and still thrive as an organization and do really well? That seemed to be the one thing holding all of us back, that we really had to look good to get the next evaluation, even when things politically, economically, whatever... Uh, weren't acting, weren't turning out the way they should have been. Well, maybe Patrick would like to take a uh, crack at this too. Thanks, Nancy. Nice to see you. Um, one, uh, the thing I think is a bigger obstacle than maybe people sort of turning up the dial 2% on the positive and down 2% on the negative on the reports to donors. Um, you know, I'm sh- sure that happens uh, in the sector, but I actually see a much bigger hurdle, and that is we have some shockingly high impediments to learning in the development sector. I mean, the way m and works in international development, and I, I'm coming as a, a relative outsider to the community who has worked in more open uh, research environments, and we basically run development projects. We do the m and based on the project. We give the m and data back to the donor. It's all, for the most part, collected using very different metrics across different projects. Um, it's then not public. And it's all, even if you could see it, it's all apples and oranges and basically impenetrable if you've ever tried to read you know, huge project reports. So if you're trying to actually learn and have cumulative knowledge in the sector, you know, I, I think the far bigger problem that I would like to see all of us tackle is having more shared metrics that we all use, having more public repositories of, of this data I personally would be interested in exploring the, the possibility of a National Science Foundation-like model where if you get public money, you have to make the data public. <laughs> um, I think that's a really worthy proposal worth exploring. Um, and then actually, one of the reasons that NGOs don't share that data is uh, you know, people who work in the sector care about the work. They want to see progress. Their natural disposition, I think, is to cooperate and be mission-oriented. But... NGOs generally are not just disincentivized, they are punished by not keeping information proprietary. And if you want to keep doing the work, you kind of have to live by the incentive structure. And that's the thing that I really would love to see an administration tackle. I mean, uh, bless USAID for trying to tackle procurement reform. That is a great thing to take on. You know, if, if I were king for a day, the thing I'd want to take on is the incentive structure in measurement and evaluation and impact data. I think we would see way more progress, and I think all of us would be empowered. But we can't just expect any one organization to be able to do that by themselves. So that's something that has to be a bit more systemic. How provocative was that, Patrick? Well, Go ahead. I, I do have a comment about the disincentives, but... Um, first, uh, in, if we're talking about evaluation, uh, I mean, we see that as independent, so we're not evaluating our own programs. And I think to be for evaluations to be legitimate, you know, at whatever stage they're carried out, they need to be impartial and independent, and that provides some legitimacy to them. But in terms of the monitoring that we do, it's, I think it's fair to say, it's certainly in our organization, but I, again, it's not unique to us. I think it's across the sector. That there's been a huge move over the last 10 years towards data-based monitoring. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, data's not political. I love Debbie Burke said this recently. <laughs> she said, data's not political and data doesn't lie. Uh, oh, that's not true. <laughs> 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 I think this poll day. What? What? Well, I, I think that that's an admirable. Any point good of economist view. can make data lie. <laughs> um, the point that I'm trying to get at is that we're we, and I think our sector is trying to be more, much more objective in using the best data that we can get to describe <clears throat> the activities that we're doing and to, to make judgments about the, the rate of progress, whether 
whether they're progressing or not. I see that as a positive development. I think there's a whole new set of tools that organizations are using now that we didn't have before. The whole approach to data visualization makes that information much more actionable for remedial um, action and for course corrections and, and as a feedback loop that you can really make decisions on. And I, I expect that that trend will continue and accellerate. Um, so I, you know, in, I, I think yeah, that the, there's a difference between your um, public relations work where you're highlighting your successes and you're, you know, you're sharing the things that you're really proud about and then your day-to-day -day monitoring of activities where you're really trying to learn from the experience about what's working, what's not working, and listen to what that feedback is telling you in terms of how you need to adjust what you're doing. And I, I see that as a positive development in, in our sector over the last few years. In terms of disincentives to data sharing, now, the thing that it made me think of is the open data sharing agreements that many donors are requiring. Funders Gates Foundation has a very aggressive uh, um, open access uh, requirement that you have to sign on to. And um, uh, USAIDS is not quite as all-encompassing as, as the Gates Foundation's, but it, it's there. And what we're seeing is that for many um, organizations that we want to work with, they won't sign those agreements because they have to give up all their intellectual property. Right. And so it's, um, there's a conflict there that has to be adjudicated be, between what is the intellectual property that is uh, justly sh and legitimately should remain with the developer of that property and um, what, what should justly be shared with, with the broad community so that everybody can benefit from it. And I think that we're sort of at the beginning my sense is that we're still at the beginning of negotiating out those arrangements. And actually, George, you asked during the course of the study, uh, what are the research questions that this study raises? And I think this actually would be, because there are really very uh, very real balancing, balances and trade-offs that need to be made here, I think this would be a great Brookings project. There so you go. I hereby <laughs> nominate it. As long as you join me. <laughs> Uh, okay, and Ra Kristen's going to get the last word, but I just wanted to say that, that Patrick made a, a favorable comment on the, the conciseness and, and, and focus and readability of the report. And, you know, at one point this report was 50 pages long, it's now 40, and it was totally different structured. And I only give Kristen credit for the basic focus of the program and for restructuring the report and for basically leading me along in this report. So that if she wants to do another study, I'm ready to join her. And before Kristen takes off, I'm going to ask you all not to do your networking in here because the staff needs to set up this room for another program, so we need to move out. It's a Kristen. beautiful day outside. We'll, we'll see you out there for conversation. Um, I just really want to thank everyone uh, who participated, and especially Brookings. It's great to be back. Um, but I, I do want to end on a positive note. There are some things in the report that are very challenging, and there are some very real uh, problems that people in the sector are trying to deal with. Um, but like Patrick, I think that most of us are embracing this. We're doing it for a good cause. And I'm a, a firm believer that you look hard at problems and in a clear-eyed way so that you can solve them, uh, not to protect yourself from the scary uh, situation that's outside the window. Um, and so that was definitely the intent of this report. And I hope that that's exactly how it will be used. We need people in the sector to be successful, and, and all of us will be better off if we look at these things, uh, come up with solutions, and work together to address them. Uh, so thanks again to all our panelists. This was a, a dream team of our interviewees. Uh, and thanks again, George. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.